Okay, we're recording. So here we go, guys. Um, try to uh, cover a couple of different things today. And for those of you who are watching this at home, we're going to, I'm going to lecture a little bit and then branch that off into talking about the assignment that you guys are going to be doing for the next couple of days. So, on the board here, guys, I've written a quote that says, the past is never dead, it's not even past. And that's by William Faulkner, who's kind of like my favorite writer and one of my personal literary heroes. And if you read Faulkner's work, he's really obsessed with the past and how the, uh, the legacy of our parents and the people that have come before us in this, this country and in the world, how it kind of shapes our, our future. I had you guys write in the journal today about choices and how all throughout life you, you have small choices that you make, but also you have these massive grand choices that you make. In any given day in your life, you might have a real simple choice. You might have to make something like what color shirt to wear, and then you might have some kind of grand choice that you have to make by the end of the day. You never know. But all these choices add up. And one of the points that I want to make today is that the choices that people have made before us also add up and influences and affects our world that we're in right now. So what we're going to talk about when we move into The Crucible, which is a play that was written in 1953, is how the past and also what was going on in the culture in America at that time, politically, socially, and so forth, how that actually shaped the, the writing of this particular piece of, of literature because although it was written in 1953, it goes back in time and it takes place in 1692. In 1692 in America, one of the strangest things that our country's ever experienced happened. It, it was a time of religious hysteria and paranoia, and it was a time of violence, and it was a time when people were literally executing their neighbors because they were found guilty in a court of law for being witches. So we're going to kind of talk about how all that comes together today. And then after we do that, we'll go into talking about what the actual assignment is that you guys are going to work on. And I hope you guys can hear me through the mask, because this is going to be a real waste of time if no one can hear me. I'll have to do some subtitles. So last week, you guys did some early American history research, and we talked about like the Europeans coming over to the country. And there was this kind of flux of people coming here in the... Uh, you know, 1500s into the 1600s from Europe. And one of the, th the things that really Americans really identify with is the idea of liberty. And of course, if we look back throughout history, we see that at times there's, there's been inconsistencies on who really has the liberty and power in this country. But ultimately, that is like one of the defining virtues of the country. And to a large extent, that goes back to the fact that these Puritans were escaping persecution in Europe. There was a group of people that set out to purify the church and break away from the corruption of Henry VIII and the idea of like paying for prayers and things like that. They wanted to form a new religion that was, that was more pure and actually based on the Bible and so forth. And they were being persecuted in Europe. So once they found out about the new, the new world, the America, they came here. So... A lot of us are descendants of these Europeans that came here. So you have this flux of people that are coming here, and they're Puritans. And on one hand, they're very, very devout. They're obsessed with their religion. But on the other hand, they're also, they have a very, very intense work ethic, which happened to be the thing that was needed to carve out the new world. You can imagine how beautiful the promised land must have looked to these people when they saw just this, this massive continent just sitting here. And some of the letters that we see from Columbus and some of the other early explorers that came here talk about the uh, availability of resources here and how willing and uh, also easy to subjugate the natives that already lived here were. So, of course, that's another chapter, the... Uh, pushing westward of the Native Americans. Um, but today we're going to focus specifically more on the idea of the Puritans. So, the Puritans kind of believe that um, basically God was watching every action that they did. So, they wanted to impress him. 
So one of the things that they really were strong about was having a really intense work ethic. So we call this the Puritan work ethic. As you're going to see looking at the Puritans, they were really conflicted in a lot of ways. They were really hard workers, but they were also capable of great violence. They considered themselves to be righteous people, but on the other hand, they were very ignorant. They were superstitious. They were living on the brink of the wilderness, so they thought that Satan was out in the forest. Um, things that they didn't understand, they didn't comprehend, they would blame on the supernatural. So... What you ended up having was a belief in witches during this time. And it was, you know, you can't prove that someone's a witch because it doesn't exist. People are not witches. So how are you going to prove something that's not true? If you read about some of the different ways that they tested people for what to be, whether they were guilty of witchcraft or not, it's really quite bizarre. In some cases, they would actually tie women up, throw them into water, and uh, if they drowned, they would say, well, I guess they weren't a witch. But at least we know they weren't a witch. Um, they would sometimes stick pins in people's moles and things like that. Anything that was considered to be unusual, like if someone had a strange deformity or something like that, they, they blamed it on something superstitious. If a woman was having trouble conceiving a child, they would, they would blame it on them being punished by, by God. Um, if the... If the you know, the crops were dying off or there was a drought. They would oftentimes think they were being punished by God. All these things that we now can, you know, really understand through science. If someone has a, uh, some kind of medical condition that prevents them from having a child, nowadays we would understand that, but back then they would blame it on witchcraft and that sort of thing. So it all culminated into this, like, feverish hysteria in 1692 when they brought in um, this court that they set up and they actually had trials for these people that were being accused of witches and it was this big mess where people were actually like blaming neighbors that they didn't like and people were like settling long existing um, feuds and things like that for instance if, if I had a problem with Shelby I'll just accuse her of being a witch and whether or not that's true she would forever be tainted with that legacy of, oh man, she, and people would suspect that. So you really see like the worst of people in Salem in 1692. And then 19 people were actually hanged. They were actually killed. And one person, a man, was actually tortured to death by pressing rocks on his chest and suffocating him. Over fire? I think so. I mean, maybe not particularly in Salem, but certainly at some point during this thing because they were coming up with all kinds of new ideas about how to hurt somebody. <laughs> so, and it all started evidently because um, these girls were caught uh, out in the forest and they weren't supposed to be in the forest and they basically, they were worried they were gonna get in big trouble so they just acted like they were in trances and couldn't talk and then they're like, what's wrong, who's possessed you? And the girls just started yelling people's names out. And those people got arrested. So all of this went down in 1692. So why is it that Arthur Miller writes about this in 1953? Because although The Crucible takes place back in 1692, it's a modern play. It takes, it's written in 1953. What made Arthur Miller write the play? So to understand that, we have to talk a little bit about what was going on in the 1950s in America. In the 1950s in America, there was a new witch hunt going on. But it wasn't a hunt to kill witches. It was a hunt to catch communists. So at that point in the country's history, America was engaged in what you guys all know is called the Cold War, when Russia was stockpiling nuclear weapons, and so was America. And the countries were at odds ideologically, and the world was split between communists and capitalists. And America saw Russia as an existential threat, and Russians saw Americans as an existential threat. And thank God we never blew each other up, but it, there was a couple of times, like during the Cuban Missile Crisis, when it almost seemed like we were going to go into nuclear war. Americans were extremely paranoid that communism was going to come into our country. And you can see this play out on the world screen. The Korean War, the Vietnam War, 
Cuban Missile Crisis. These are all um, military endeavors that the United States got involved in to stop the spread of communism during that time. Luckily, Russia and America never fought, or it would have been really bad. USSR, the Soviets. So, during that time, there was a senator in America named Joseph McCarthy, and he had a ton of power, and he started arresting people, and they suspended civil rights, and you could be arrested and brought before um, the Senate just basically because somebody accused you of being a communist. So it was very similar to what was happening in Salem, although they weren't hanging these people. But if you were found guilty for communism, you actually could be executed. It had happened before. And it got out of control. And there was a number of innocent people. Hey, buddy. Hi. I'm filming this lecture right now, so you see me it's not seeming intense, that's why. So a number of people were actually found guilty of being communists, and their careers were being crushed and ruined by this guy, Joseph McCarthy, and other people. And Arthur Miller, who was an artist at the time, who had expressed some, some doubts about capitalism because his father had lost his fortune during the Great Depression, um, he was actually brought before the committee in charge with communism. And he was you know, not found guilty, but nonetheless, a lot of people's careers were being ruined because of this. There was a Hollywood blacklist. Um, Sadly, a lot of like really great Americans actually cooperated with these, these senators. Walt Disney was one of them. Um, uh, who else? Eli Kazan, who was a great filmmaker he made on the waterfront, and Streetcar Named Desire. Some of these people were, you know, working with the committee, and then other people were actually like standing up against it, saying, hey, this is against our civil rights, this is crazy. And what Arthur Miller realized was that basically, this was the same thing that was going on in Salem back in 1692. So it's an artist's job to make the world aware of such a comparison. So what does Arthur Miller do? He says, I'm a, I'm a playwright. My weapon is to write a play. I'm going to write a play. So he writes The Crucible in 1953. And it's about what happened in 1692 in Salem. But it's designed to make the reader or whoever's watching the play performed, draw a parallel between 1692, Salem Witch Trial, and 1953, McCarthyism, Communist Red Scare. So that's what's going on here. And that's why this book is so awesome. And it is an amazing dramatization of those things. I mean, we don't know what was going on behind closed doors with those people that actually were brought before the... Uh, court and accused of witchcraft and actually hanged, but Arthur Miller imagines that, and he develops these characters and brings them back out of the dust. And going back to the journal, which is about the choices that we make in life, I love The Crucible because it's about this question of when the world's going crazy, what's it take to have the guts to actually stand up and not fold under pressure, but to stand up against what's, what's wrong and stand up for what's right. So that is essentially the history of the Communist Red Scare and how that ties in with the Crucible. So the next thing I want to do with you guys is talk about the assignment you're going to do. So this is under assignments and if you go to the Red Scare, the Salem Witch Trials and Media Project, you can open up the file. And you guys are going to get creative now. So here's what I've written out for you guys. It is common for the leaders of any society to use the current fears of the time, or the hysteria of the time, to rule by using the insecurities and the paranoia of the people as a tool. Just look at the Cold War, which I discussed today. Leaders who rule with fear, this is an interesting term, are known as demagogues. What is a demagogue? Technically, a demagogue is a political leader who seeks support by appealing to the desires and prejudices of ordinary people 
rather than by using rational arguments, okay? That's what a demagogue does. They get you worked up about things. Senator Joseph McCarthy was one of America's most notorious demagogues. Demagogues have had quite an impact on the world we live in. Every generation spawns. We jump back in time to the theocracy of 1692. And if you remember from last week's notes, a theocracy is a government that's uh, meshed with religion. Theo means religion. So it's a theocracy. Um, in 1692, in the theocracy, you had these rulers were demigods. They were playing on people's fears, paranoias, insecurities, and so forth. They exploited the terror of Salem to fight a relentless campaign against witchcraft, which they really, I think, some of these people actually really believed in. Here's your assignment for today, guys. And you're going to either use massive paper I can give you, or you could do it as a slideshow on your computer. People at home, you'll have to do it on a slideshow. Your assignment is to imagine, okay? So you're going to have to actually get to the mindset of the people back in 1692. You are a leader in the town of Salem at the beginning of the witchcraft crusade. You must create an informational pamphlet to educate the people of Salem on the existence and dangers of witches. So you are a true believer in this particular assignment. You believe in this stuff. So, as I say here, you can do this as a slideshow, even though obviously there were no computers in 1692, but instead of doing it as like a pamphlet, each slide can represent like a different page in the pamphlet. So, what do I want inside of this packet, or this pamphlet? First and foremost, you got to have an attention hitting um, cover. Because, you know, it's basically how media works, right? This is a media project. Even though we're going back in time and looking at ancient media, we're tr the idea is still the same. What is media? If you don't know, media is how information is disseminated or spread to the public. So nowadays we have the internet, television, various other things. But back then, you would have only had printed material, okay? So you got to catch the reader's attention. Think of the headlines on the news. That is the current form of media or on the internet, which is used to get anxiety in the eye of the viewer. Salem did not have that, so they would have to come up with something printed. So that's what you guys are doing. You're creating this media. You gotta have some kind of cover that has some kind of macabre, disturbing in imagery that catches the reader's attention. Use a blood curdling catch line and come up with eerie artwork representing the threat. Remember, you're trying to scare the people into reacting to the witch hysteria. You want them to be anxious. Now, that you have the attention of the hypothetical citizen, you must inform them. This is the stuff that I want you guys to have inside of your packet or on your inside slides. First of all, have a slide or a page that talks about what is the current problem in Salem. So we're back in 1692. You're telling people that we have a problem with Satan, we have a problem with witches. The crops are dying, you know, people are acting strange. There's tension and terror in the town. This means that witches are alive. So you kind of are just getting creative here when you guys describe it. Next, you need to explain what to look for in spotting or identifying a witch. You can list this out in numbered sentence form. Be creative. Anything that was seen as out of the ordinary could have been an example of what they might have said to look out for. So, you guys are going to just use your own creativity on that. And you can also look up witchcraft on the internet, and I can help you out with that too, in finding out a little more information of what they were thinking about back then. But just get creative. If somebody had a weird limp, they could be accused of being a witch. If somebody had a strange birthmark, or a, I don't know, a weird joint on their hand, and their fingers lock up weird or something, or arthritis, they might be like, oh my god, witchcraft. So get creative with that. Finally, what do we do if we find a witch? Write a paragraph for that. Um, you know, basically you're going to get brought in to court. You're going to get tried. Um, we can look up on the internet examples of how they tried these people. If they're found guilty, they get hanged. If they confess, even if they're found guilty, they live. If they deny it, they die. So, all of that is on Google. Uh, the Google Doc that is connected to Canvas. And that's pretty much what you guys are going to work on for the rest of the hour. 
And you guys at home, you do the same thing. Email me if you have questions.